Welcome. We're in the uh, yeah. the third episode of a of a relaunch of uh, Stephen Friends, and uh, we've got in studio here today, obviously Steve Keen and uh, Tyrone Keynes. Uh, why don't you both say hi to the guests, and uh, and we'll get uh, we'll get onto the show. Okay. Good to be back again. Um, yes. So, um, yep. Yeah. Oh no. Go go ahead, Steve. No, you, you tell me. I'm, I'm just sitting back. I am very happy to be back after seven days. It's been a long seven days of <laughs> moderate beer drinking in the evenings, um, work yeah. during the days, work during the afternoons, and work into the late hours of the night. Hmm. Why is it... Uh, <laughs> what's that? Including the work... The consulting work you're doing by the looks of it's taking up part of that time. It is taking up a, a great deal of the time. You know, when I, I make models, um, when I'm doing my own research, pra like practicing my own research, um, it's very easy because it's, it's like an artist uh, painting on a canvas um, mm. versus trying to take somebody else's vision and putting that on mm. the canvas is a, a yeah. lot more ch a lot more challenging for sure so it's it it does take up some time so hmm. yeah well i have a question i mean i was talking with ty here uh, a couple days ago and to punctuate that point ty you you'd mentioned something about picking your clients and uh the job is a little bit like a marathon right so if if you had to build models with something you didn't believe in, uh, mm. you would, you'd run out of gas. So there's, there's a little bit of, uh, um, there's a choosing function where you're looking at, at, at the client, you're looking at the models they're trying to build and you kind of have to accept them and choose your clients. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I I'd say, yeah, yeah. If in order to like in any project, you have to be passionate about it if you're going to contribute in a meaningful manner versus taking something on and generically applying your skill set um i think there the results are completely different uh one being passionate about what they're doing and one just applying what they know to to what they're doing um, I think the end result, um, you're going to get a better product out of what you're passionate about. Um, and I say this to anybody. Um, I think a passionate per person can accomplish far more than a person that has all these skill sets but is not actually passionate about what they're doing. So you could take a, I, I'll use the word, layman person who's really excited about an idea, and you can take a, mm -hmm. another person that has eight years and a PhD, but isn't so excited about what they're doing. And that layman person is going to create magic. That's, mm. that's, that's what I believe. And that's been my personal experience with anything I do. I, I do happen to know some things, not a lot, but some, um, but when it's something I really, really enjoy, and it, it, often those things that I really, really enjoy, I don't really know a lot about the issues. It's the learning process, uh, mm. you know, when I get passionate about something. That's where I achieve things versus trying to take past knowledge and applying it to maybe a recycled idea or something that I'm just not that interested in. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. How, and how about you, Steve? I think we heard on the last episode that that you got a uh, a contract uh, working um, within the tight confi confines of your work through a consulting company, so that uh, you're kind of getting paid to do what you like doing, anyways. Is that is that is exactly? That I mean, yeah, yeah. I've I've had lots of offers of consulting jobs over time, and I turned all of them down. For the simple reason that I want to be able to do my own research and I don't want to be distracted from it. Now, I know people who get involved in consulting, they spend all the time trying to raise money and bugger all actually working at what they want to get the money for, which is to fund their own research. So I've, I've stayed away from it for that reason. But I was approached by a group called Carbon Tracker to bring the knowledge I have about how bad neoclassical economics of climate change is to the finance sector. And I said, look, you're, you, you, you're, 
you're 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 willing to pay me for something I'm going I'd be willing to do for free. I won't do it for free, but uh, that's the attitude. So, in in that sense, you know, I'm passionate about it, and it's fabulous to be given a contract to get it done. The difficulty compared to what Ty's going through is I've got to read a whole lot of neoclassical shit to do this properly, and oh my god, it just you know my my saturation level. I hit saturation. Well, I started about you know eight o'clock in the morning. I hit saturation by twelve, and uh, you know there's only only so many times you can read through a neoclassical text and think, how did this idiot think this is a sensible idea? Yeah, um, but yeah. So that passion, passion with um, what's what's there's a classic say the the power and the passion. There's actually a great Australian rock song called the power and the passion. Well, I've got the passion without the power because I'm putting up with neoclassical garbage in putting this together. Ty's got the power and the passion. Right, right. Well, there was uh, you were you were having to weed through a lot of that bullshit when you were doing the mm. the paper that penis paper, and yeah, the, the, you actually, mm, yeah, you actually had to prove proving something on something that was so uh, fallacious in its. Uh, in, in its its foundation is 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 like eyeball scratching, I guess. With that, and just yeah, just that's a good that's a good way of expressing it. Yeah, I mean, I mean I, like, and, and the more I read in the neoclassical thing, the more I, I just you know, my scratching my eyeballs out all the time. I mean, for example, there's probably the uh, the paper which um, gives the largest prediction of damages from climate change in the entire neoclassical canon is a paper by Burke et al. in two thousand, I think it's two thousand and fifteen. And they come up with a prediction of a 23% fall in GDP by 2100. And that's actually the biggest prediction they give. I think it's in conjunction with about a four degree increase in temperature. So that's that's the best one they've got, is it? Well, in reading it through, and what I do is I don't just read the paper, I read the supplementary materials as well. And they decided, it, it, for a start, they just took data between 1960 and 2017 and extrapolated that data forward linearly, which is a great start. But then the, the, they got a prediction of a 25% fall in GDP from a four degree temperature increase. Um, but that that's wasn't their actual prediction from their modeling technique. What they did was they said, oh, we've only got data, like in terms of current data now about temperatures of 30 degrees Celsius, average, average temperatures of 30 degrees. So they decided to assume anything above 30 degrees would have the same, um, temperature, the same damage to GDP as in, 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 like from 30 to 40 degrees in temperature made no difference to their predictions. They simply mm -hmm. assumed that and said, oh, we don't want to go out of data. You know, we don't make an out of data prediction. Mm -hmm. And we don't actually know what's going to be the impact of all this stuff. For Christ's effing sake, the whole idea of doing this stuff is to do an out of sample prediction. We haven't yet sampled six degree temperatures over three industrial you're supposed to be making a prediction about what that would mean. Of course, you've got to go out of sample. So they constrained their predictions about the damage from climate change to what they got out of data up to 2000, between 2000, you know, 1964 and 2017, I think it was. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, you just, you spend your time continually shaking your head and gagging. So, um, you know, I'd be rather doing what, what Ty is doing. Mm, yeah. Well, to put that into context, that's a, there's another um, there's another <clears throat> framework where I, I want to bring up the idea of um, the Great Depression, because um, my understanding was that the uh, the neoclassical models are 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 not bringing in the, the previous history of the Great Depression into their models like it could happen again. Would, would that be fair to say? And do you see oh, a parallel? Yeah, a parallel between that and um, just the 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 blinding, uh, burying your head in the sand type of um, uh, description that you're talking about by staying completely in a closed system and and not not looking at the at the the possibilities of where the climate can actually go. Oh yeah. I mean, they, they simply don't want to consider anything that gets outside the range of, uh, of current data uh, because we, we're losing Ty quite regularly. He must be having a hard time with his, uh, with his connection. Um, yeah, they, 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 just, they just don't want to consider outside their paradigm. And so when you look at um, um, you know, climate change, 
uh, that potentially implies the destruction of productive capability on the planet. Oh, I can't have that. So let's stick with data that doesn't give that result. Well, you know what? I, I was hesitant to bring this up, um, but because I, I think we've, I've, I've I think we've um, kind of uh, discounted this this particular fellow on on on, on a couple of occasions, but um, there is a, a a recent uh, podcast from Lex Friedman where he brought up um, uh, Bjorn Lomborg, and he oh, framed yeah, it as he had Lomborg, yeah Lomborg versus who was the other person he had Lomborg versus. Um... Uh, he was a, he's a, a, a science writer uh, for the New York Times yeah. type of scenario, right? And the yeah. framing is 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 what I had an, an issue with it because, I mean, I love Lex, right? I mean, he's he's great, but he framed it as you've got the deniers on one side, and then you've got the catastrophic thinkers on the other side, and in 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 one sense. I mean, that's true. You've got like the two polarized sort of like positions, but um, very quickly into the show, it, it, it discounted and almost made a false equivalent equivocation of uh, the, the threat of, of, of climate change to say that it's uh, a little kooky in a way, like, you know, we really shouldn't be focusing on 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 the catastrophic potentials of climate change the alarmist uh reality of 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 the climate situation and i personally find that when i when i bring this up with other academics or or thinkers laymen or academics they they fall into that where you know they try and stay away from the polls and they try and stay moderate and think that there's a um, there's a midpoint that, that we can find. Um, and, um, I just, I wanted to hear what you would, I wanted to hear your opinion on that. Like, are we, should we stay away from the alarmist, uh, catastrophic, uh, end of species kind of conversation? Is it dangerous? Is it, is this our hubris speaking? Like what I, I, I don't know. Am I, should we take a step back from that? What are your thoughts? No, we should take a step forward to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Frankly, this is what the scientists themselves are saying. If we get anywhere near the levels that economists think are going to cause minor damage to GDP, like for you now four degree increase in temperature, that'll be the end. Western civilization would have ended before we reached that level. Wow. Okay. Uh, Eastern civilization as well, quite probably. So yes, we should be having catastrophic conversations because that's if you look at what the scientists have to say. That is, that is absolutely a uh, future we face if we don't stop the points that are, we're right on the verge of. I mean, the, 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 the obvious, most important immediate tipping point is the Arctic summer sea ice. And that, I, I just, I haven't got the paper right in front of me, but quoting a paper from um, uh, James Anderson, who's professor of chemistry at Harvard University. So he's obviously, you know, let, let's not say, let's say he's not a crackpot. Okay? Um, his 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 paper from 2017 included data showing that the volume of ice in the Arctic Circle had fallen from I think 17. I'm, I'm not sure of the actual unit. You know, I think it's 17 um, uh, 17 billion tons or something of that nature. 74 over the last uh, from from 1960 to to 2015. And if you extrapolate that for just this to it's very much a linear progression. If you plot that forward, we hit zero uh, sometime. Uh, certainly between 2025 and 2035. So that is already activated. I'll see if I can actually, if I can find it and, and share the screen to show it to you, that particular piece of data. So we're already in a realm where we, we've probably already tipped uh, one of the most significant tipping points. And uh, so, yes, we should be talking about it. And the thing is, how do you talk about it in a way that doesn't turn... Like the, you want people to, you, when you talk, you want people to listen. Okay? Now, the trouble is you talk too frankly, people just don't want to know and you've got a chance they're going to walk away from you. So that's one of the dangers. But you need at the same time to say, if you don't do something, you won't be able to walk at some time in the near future. And so that's the situation I find myself in. 
Yeah, and the shame about about Lex's podcast and that and that episode was that, um, you know, there's a lot of people that watch watch Lex shows, right? I mean, you know, they're they're approaching him, yeah. you know, a million, uh, you know, views per episode and a million views. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's it, it's crazy, and and you know, you have even even Lex, yeah, you know, walks into that trap of saying, well, let's stay away from the two extremes, and is it really that bad? And you end up you end up downplaying the, you know, the intensity yeah. of, and the seriousness of, of the conversation. So the, the long board conversation should really have been, um, you know, like Steven Lomberg, not, you know, not that, not the science writer. <laughs> Cause they were all just friendly yeah. talking. Have about a on the other side. Of, yeah. Yeah. So did can you, you uh, can you, you see my screen right now, by the way, those are images. I hope I'm sharing my screen. Okay, are you seeing seeing the? Are you, can you, what are you seeing when you're looking at my the screen? Are you seeing a, a, a set of charts or something else? We're seeing your file structure with a preview of. Uh, that's what I. That's what I. That, that's what. That's what I thought you might be sure. I've got many screens here, so I'll try sharing again in a second. What I want to know what I'll do. I'll just actually put this on a, a third screen so I can distinguish easily from what I'm looking at here. So let's just do this. Okay. And that's the screen I want to share. Okay. So can you see this one now? Oh, yes. There you go. Maybe make it full screen so you can see it more clearly. So this is this is actual data. Slide A there is minimum September volume from 15, or so roughly 17,000 in 1980 to, as of 2017, about five. So that's you know about a seventy percent fall over that time. Just continue drawing that line down, and zero is going to be about here, which uh, there's, there's five and fifteen. So zero is down about here. So you come over here. Uh, I'd say that it's about twenty thirty, twenty forty, something in that range. Now, uh, what uh, Anderson is saying in that paper is that when that happens, and this he, he's to give Anderson a, a, a bit more background, he He's the person who discovered the hole in the ozone layer. Okay, so he's not somebody you should be ignoring. The hole in the ozone layer, uh, and the person who led largely led the campaign to close the hole quite successfully, of course, to preventing CFCs and so on. So he focuses upon just upon the ozone effect of this. What he says is, when we get uh, zero Arctic summer sea ice, plus also about another eighty parts per million of carbon dioxide. And the two will be, uh, the current trends will hit the first 2030, 20, say between 2025 and 2035, maybe 2040, and we'll hit the second in 2050 on current trends. At that point, uh, what you will have is a, and I, I'll leave the, the dynamics out for a moment now, but you will get a dynamic that means we get a wet stratosphere rather than a dry sphere. Now, to amateurs like, like me, what's the difference? Who knows? A bit of water in the history? Who cares what happens is that water that moisture which we'll get from the troposphere where we live the stratosphere will carry with it chloride and bromide and that chloride and bromide will increase according to uh, anderson increase the destruction of ozone by a factor of 100. oh now what that okay what that means is that there's nothing else causing more to be created you have a hundred times faster destruction rate that means a catastrophic collapse in the ozone layer. And that in turn means that it will be not possible for humans to go outdoors during summer, unless they're covered in you know, 50 or 100 plus sun UV protection. Uh, because we are, as the, as the naked ape, we are particularly susceptible to an increase in UV radiation. It'll damage us as well, damage other animals, but humans in particular are incredibly vulnerable. Now, climate change could mean, and it could mean it before 2050. So if people think that, that that is something you don't want to play with, okay? Yeah. And and that is that is the sort of thing, if you're not talking about that, then people think climate change means it gets a bit warmer during winter and maybe it'll be difficult during summer. So you've got to whack more air conditioning on. So we trivialize it because we don't talk about the extreme uh, outcomes. The extreme outcomes are civilization destroying. And unless we realize that's the case, then the civilization will be destroyed before we start doing something about it. 
That's very, that's, uh, you know, very scary. And I, and I would also uh, assume that um, even if we, as the naked ape, as you explain, uh, mm. we were particularly susceptible to it under the, the, the rays of the sun. But I mean, I'm imagining that a lot of our um, uh, plant production and agriculture would be decimated as well. So even if we could have proper yeah. UV protection, the, uh, the, the, the 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 agriculture would be decimated would do is that true as well yeah oh that's also true i mean plants have a plants have a higher capacity to reflect uv radiation or handle uv radiation than, they, than we do but they still have their cellular structure broken down by too much i think it's uva and uva i'm not a scientist and there anderson clearly is he's the global expert on ozone oh. and professor of chemistry so he knows what he's talking about this area i am quoting a scientist here rather than being one uh, but clearly uh, uh, destroying the protection we have from solar and cosmic radiation is not a good idea for a planet with life on it hey i can give you a bit of a plug steve because um as an economist um you you know you, like you've said on on the lex podcast you said uh it's a discipline and so you're not a scientist but you're an aspiring scientist trying to move the, <laughs> trying to move the the discipline into uh a scientific realm and uh that'll kind of bring me into my next phase to pull away from climate change and i wanted to ask you about that um with the the minsky software and in in general the uh you know the complexity science in the system dynamic uh, community, do you think that there's hope mm. for uh, economics as a whole to eventually become a uh, uh, a, a scientific um, discipline at some point in the future? Well, actually, one of my favourite uh, people who tried to bring science economic well before me was a guy called John Blatt, who was professor of um, of uh, mathematics at at New South Wales University when I became aware of his work. But before that, he'd been, uh, he actually helped design the world's second ever computer called the Ciliac, which was built at Sydney University. He's an Aust he was an Austrian uh, as a refugee, a Jewish refugee from the, uh, from the Nazis as a child, and uh, first went to America and then came to Australia because he and his father and the, uh, the right-wing politics of America, this is back in the McCarthyist days. Uh, so that's why he ended up in Australia. And he was twice nominated for the Nobel Prize in Physics. So he's somebody who is a scientist in that sense. Um, and he uh, looked at the state of neoclassical economics, was so horrified. that I think I, I told the story, I think I may have mentioned it last time, the reason he got involved in economics was because he was actually invited to a seminar done by a friend of mine at the time, uh, a lovely uh, person who happened to be a neoclassical economist uh, as well. Um, and John, after watching it, was so horrified by what this guy thought was advanced economics that he decided to look at it himself. And the book, which I highly recommend to anybody who wants to get a good handle of what economics would be and should be, uh, is called Dynamic Economic Systems. And as part of that, he said, indeed, some may say that capitalism will cease to exist as a social system before economists properly understand its dynamics. I think he's going to be right. I, th I think the economics will not change at the mass level. There's the certainly contributions being made that enable to become more like a science at the moment at uh, you know, the dynamic stuff that i'm working on the knowledge about engine en energy and so on we won't get there in time i've got, I, I i really think that climate change will be an existential for capitalism and only after it's effectively collapsed because the only way we can maintain a um a, a, a human society through adjusting with climate change, I think it's going to be a war economy. So that's the you know the, the best we can hope for is a is a 1939 to 45 style war economy with capitalist firms being told what to do by a government. Uh, that's likely where you get to, and then only in the middle of that are we going to start developing a realistic economics. So um, I, I think in this case the neoclassicals have won. Right. So let's be clear at their um, own expense, of course, but they've won. Yeah, let's be clear on on what a a war economy actually means. It doesn't um, it doesn't mean that uh, in, in this uh, future reality, you're not you're not saying that we are uh, at war with each other in in terms of nations. We're we're just at a last resort 
in terms of resource production and using uh, the tradition of the military to um, uh, uh, to produce and deploy logistics and is is that what you're thinking? I mean, I, I would I would assume there would be some yeah, yeah. increased tensions and and possibly some more outbreaks in war. But you're saying that the the two are not uh, it's not necessary. You're not you're not guessing that we're going to be in a a world state of nations uh, warring in in a you know all at war. Uh, if are, we are, then we have, if, if we are in those cases, we won't have any chance at all. So yes, I'm I'm basically saying a war economy in the same sense that the war economy was a was a total. Uh, it was a capitalist economy where you use the existence of private firms and therefore by government government uh, money creation to devote as much of your resources as possible to fighting that particular foe in the Second World War, being the Germans and the and the Japanese, uh, and minimise as much as possible the normal consumption. So you had rationing for the public, uh, mm -hmm. reduction of, of of consumer demand. And as much of a demand is is a productive capacity as possible was put towards producing armaments for the Second World War. We'll need to be in the same, uh, yeah, over here, command. As Thomas is saying in, in the discussion, we need a command economy, and a command you still have economy. capitalist firms. You, you still still make you still have people making money out of making rather than tanks. They may be making mirrors, you know, mirrors to reflect energy into the into um, our government command economy. Yeah, Thomas again. Um, yeah, you you need a command economy everything possible being thrown at reducing the temperature of the planet before we fall apart. Uh, and then as little consumption as possible and consumption control by rationing rather than by the price system. And that's why I say it's not a capitalist economy anymore. If your allocation of goods is by a rationing system and the rationing system is giving you whatever, uh, you know, the, everybody gets the same minimum amount that's necessary to survive and you don't get any more, um, uh, then you are not in a capitalist economy. The pri the neoclassical often regard the al the price allocation system as the essential defining element of capitalism. Well, that won't be there. So we'll have a post-capitalist society uh, while we while we address climate change if we're successful in holding societies together. That's a very good explanation. Um, I I'm what uh, we were just talking about tipping points, but I'm as I'm I'm curious about mm -hmm. the tipping point when the uh, the the conservative governments uh, actually realize and react to this. What what do you what would you because personally, and I think you feel similar. It's um, it it feels like uh, liberal sensibilities. Okay, and I'm not talking about irrational liberal politics. I'm saying liberal sensitivities and rationality seems to. For every step forward that you you make, there's three steps moving back because it's in such a gridlock, especially in the United States, between the red and the blue parties, the Republicans and the mm -hmm. Democrats. But we see this all over the world: mm -hmm. um, the, the the conservatives coming back, trying to push back to business as usual, thinking that it's a a, a global liberal conspiracy. I mean, we've laughed about this on this show yeah. and other shows that you know the liberals couldn't plan their way out of a wet paper bag because. You know, they just they, they can't. But um, there, for yeah. me, I feel like it's almost like, you know, not giving up, but it's just like I'm very tired. I'm very tired of trying to explain and move move the needle when the, me the needle just goes in the opposite direction. For every effort you make, it seems to be pushed back further. So my, my question is, is it, um, at what point, do the conservative parties step in and say, oh, yeah, this does make sense. And now we need to implement this uh, this command economy. Like at, at what point does that um, like what was the economic landscape look like? What is the climate reality look like when that that conservative voice steps in and says, OK, now we're going to do something about this? I, I think when it's like if you remember the, the Second World War, the leaders the, the, certainly, the leader in, in England in the Second World War was an arch conservative, William Winston Churchill. So it's it's when you realise there's an existential threat that you take on a radical position. And like Churchill was all for he was he had rationing in the economy. You had everything was being the government funding paid for everything. Uh, you, you you know private corporations were building the 
the like the, the, the Spitfire, the, the the plane they were making, the bombs, the, the weaponry, and so on and so forth. But it was all the command economy, and he had no problem with that because it was existential. And I think that's why I'm going to go back and share from my screen again. This is why we might find conservatives um, becoming the ones who actually do something radical about climate change. Because this again is from Anderson's paper that he said is going to cause the break ozone layer actually involves the storms over the over the uh, mid, mid uh, the uh, middle of the United States. Hmm. So where this is most first going to manifest itself is right in the heart, right in Republican territory. Wow. So well, what actually happens? At, yeah, I know, crazy, but it looks crazy, but it's true. And this is actually empirical. This this is his explanation for data have already found because. Um, at, at the moment, like most storms, when the when the storms reach their peak, the storms peak out below the level of the troposphere, which is I think it's about twenty kilometers. Okay, so you imagine a storm which reaches twenty kilometers high. That means that if you're in a plane, you'd be flying through that storm. That doesn't happen often. Okay, but mm -hmm. because of the extra energy that's supplied by global warming, the storms that build up over the the, the plane, the, the western plains of America, get so much additional energy that they the tops of them burst through the, from the top of the stratosphere into the, into the top of the troposphere into the stratosphere and they carry the moisture up with them. Now, if that starts happening, the first part on the planet that's going to be uninhabitable because of climate change is Republican, the Republican heartland. So if that does happen, wow. I've got a feeling Republicans will suddenly go for being fans of, uh, of government, uh, government control. A different form of government control, one where it's, yeah, I mean, where they're they're reallocating the military complex into uh, something domestic as in, yeah, that's, that's very interesting, Steve. Um, and I think that's almost what has mm -hmm. to happen in, in order for, uh, you know, the world governments to but that, coalesce. Yeah, that, that. That, that's my fear. I mean, people like Bjorn Lomborg and, and the people who supply ammunition to Bjorn Lomborg, call me out William Norhouse, Richard Toll, Mendelssohn, all the neoclassical economists, including Simon Dietz, Gernot Wagner, and so on, he's using their material to, to deny the dangers of climate change. So without neoclassical economists, uh, he could still cherry pick science data and find, you know, uh, look what looked like holes in the science data. But he's using un, un, totally accepting without any critical faculty whatsoever being applied to the output of economists. That's where his denialism is coming from. Um, so that, that, that stuff uh, is, is what gives him capacity to fight the, fight the, the scientists on this front. Now, if they, the economists didn't exist, all they could do is cherry pick. Okay. Mm. But he's actually used, able to use their material to say, oh, no, there's no danger, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what then this is but this is typical of humans we don't respond to the threat of a crisis we respond to a crisis and if you look again at the second world war churchill was not i don't know how much he is the lone voice but he certainly was a you know the most prominent isolated voice saying we can't negotiate with hitler uh we we, we have to uh, take military action against him etc cetera, etc cetera. and he was ignored until after poland had fallen yeah. and then oh shit uh, Poland's fallen. We've got our own army on the on the mainland. They're surrounded at uh, at Dunkirk. Uh, Two hundred and fifty thousand British soldiers are about to be slaughtered. Okay. Um, then he became he began, took took Chamberlain's place. So with the classic of Pisa. So I think the same thing applies this time around. Until we get a threat which nobody can deny, uh, virtually nobody can deny, then we're going to continue on the same business as usual course which means that, you know, we won't do anything about this until after the first major tipping points have triggered and they've started causing potentially catastrophic effects on our own culture and, and economy. And that's as scary as hell because, um, we know, when, when the British realised that Hitler really was an existential threat to Britain, he hadn't landed on British soil. He wasn't marching up, toward, wasn't marching up the Thames. Uh, this time round, we won't... Uh, realise it's an existential threat at the collective level until such time as London, New York, Washington and a few others are occupied by the impact of global warming. And then the question is, will we have the capacity to actually react at that point and make decisions that enable us to do something to reverse it?
Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking about the 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 status quo, um, <clears throat> I'd like to change gears a little bit, and I want to ask you um, about the Fed. So just take a minute to detox from the the you know the climate okay. conversation a little bit, and <clears throat> I. I'd like to know what runs through the mind of Steve Keen when you hear the um, the response from the Fed uh, adjusting interest rates to control inflation. Um, is it all garbage? What is the role of the Fed? Um, is it completely misguided? Is it uh, is it? Uh, basically, if Steve Keen had keys to the car and was advising, uh, you know, uh, uh, the the policymakers in 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 the Fed, what would you mm. what would you be advising them in terms of our current situation? Um, because the re the reason why I ask this is that um, the the conversation around inflation is getting polarized between left and right, and um, you know, you can probably see where this is going into, uh, you know, fiscal responsibility and overspending and so on and so forth. But mm, mm. Do, you, do, you, do you think that the Fed is as powerful? First question, do you think the Fed is as powerful uh, and um, as necessary as, as we've been led to believe in, in, in the last 50 to 100 years? Well, the Fed is necessary as a clearinghouse for private banks. That, that's its fundamental. If you want to say what the function of the bank, the Federal Reserve is fundamentally, it's a clearinghouse for transfer between private banks. And that's a role which you, you have to have that role. I think Bearings used to play that role. It may have been JP Morgan or, or Chase or whatever in America uh, decades ago, you know, a century or so ago. But you need a clearinghouse where they can meet and can cancel out. My father actually worked on the board that did that in Australia. And that occurred, that was happening before the uh, Australian. Uh, Reserve Bank of Australia was created, and it was done by the Commonwealth Bank, which is a publicly owned bank. Uh, but it, it it wasn't it wasn't actually supposed to be a central bank. So the clearing function, so you know Westpac or what's called the Bank of New South Wales, could clear its debts with the National Bank by meeting at a meeting with the Commonwealth Bank, which my father was the Commonwealth Bank representative on on a daily basis to net, to net out transactions. So the Federal Reserve takes that role, and it's eminently sensible that you have a. a a, a non a non privately owned institution doing that, so that role's that role's necessary. What's become fallacious about them is that first of all, neoclassical economists have said uh, that fiscal policy is impotent and monetary policy is the only powerful one. When the exact opposite applies, okay, fiscal power, fiscal power policy is powerful and monetary policy is relatively impotent. So they've tried to manage the economy just using changes in the rate of interest in the belief that that will then determine the level of investment and that will control the economy. And that is completely ignoring what Keynes realised, that investment occurs under conditions of uh, you know, uncertainty, fundamental uncertainty. You can't predict the future. You therefore extrapolate forward what's happening right now. And if you have a change in what your expectations are based on current conditions, that will cause an investment boom or slump, uh, independent of the rate of interest. And to try to restrain people's desire to invest during a bubble or to encourage them to invest during a slump, the interest rate is relatively trivial. Okay? So that's the, um, that, that's the perspective overall. So, but instead, neoclassical economists really coming out of, um, uh, say, well, there's a whole lot of people who are responsible. Wallace, Sargent, um, uh, uh, Lucas, uh, uh, Kidlin, Prescott, Muth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They all there's the neoclassical economists are by nature anti-fiscal policy. They would prefer to have a zero government deficit. That's that's their preferred level. Okay, uh, and, and and if not zero, then then a surplus. So their whole idea is to attack the idea that you can modify the economy using fiscal policy. And if you read their papers, which unfortunately I have done, uh, you will find that they they say that uh, uh, we rashly anticipate the future. So you and I know that if uh, if the government runs a deficit today of 3% of GDP, that sometime in the future, maybe after we're dead, um, that will have to be paid back. And therefore what you and I do is when the interest rate goes up, we spend less. 
because we know we've got to save money for our great great grandchildren so that they can pay their future tax bill. They literally use altruism of all bloody people to use altruism as a mechanism. So that's part of the base of which they said fiscal policy doesn't work. And then they said, well, the one thing you can't control is the interest rate. And one um, self-serving reason why they'll push the interest rate as the uh, control mechanism is that uh, when you get to the, first of all, you get the independence monetary policy effect of, uh, which, which of central banks, which came about uh, largely during the inflation period of the 70s because politicians did not want to be the ones putting up interest rates. They were happy to say, you economists take this job, you know? You're happy with being unpopular, you put up the interest rates. So Vokali did that massively in the 80s. Um, so that means politicians could wash their hands as something which could have a negative impact upon their re-election potential. Uh, but also for economists, it meant, guess who staffs the Federal Reserve? A whole tribe of neoclassical economists. So it strengthened the neoclassicals to say, Fiscal policy is weak. Monetary policy is powerful. Now, of course, that's in, in, in politics and trying to dominate a system. In reality, it's the other way around. Fiscal policy is far more powerful. Monetary policy is relatively irrelevant. And they've tried to be managing the economy using an irrelevant tool. And now they're doing it again. Mm, interesting. Interesting. Okay. Well, we've got five more minutes uh, uh, before we jump into a few questions here from the audience. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask you about your uh, your your. <laughs> so take a minute to to think about this a little bit, Steve. And and ch I, I'm changing gears again. But your mm. PhD thesis. Um, I remember in one of your most recent lectures, you were talking about your your PhD thesis, and I believe, if I'm paraphrasing it correctly, um, you were referring to um, spending on on. Uh, uh, marketing efforts in times of growth versus uh, uh, cutting spending on on marketing. If 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 companies are actually in, um, if it's a non-growth economy, is that would that be fair to say? Uh, in a very that's not my that's not my PhD thesis. That's most likely me talking about pricing functions and how how firms set prices. Right. Okay. So what what was your PhD thesis then? Um, because I'm. I, modeling, I, modeling Minsky, modeling Minsky. That was my PhD thesis. My master's thesis was explaining why Marx's labor theory of value was wrong using Marx's own philosophy. And my PhD thesis was, was building a mathematical model of Minsky's financial instability hypothesis. So the stuff on the, the stuff you're talking about is actually related to my critique of the theory of the firm and theory of competition and price setting. That's relevant for the inflation discussion if you want to talk about it, but it wasn't yeah. in my, either of my yeah. theses. Yeah. Okay. Well, this, this, this is this is some potential for what central banks are doing to actually reduce the rate of inflation. Okay, so because when you look at prices uh, from first principles, you get what Kaliski came up with, which is a pricing function that said the the price level, and and therefore when you look at rate of change, you differentiate this term so you get what causes the rate of change in the price level, which is inflation. But he said it's price level is the the markup capitalists put upon their inputs what they pay for their inputs and how productive their inputs are, those three factors. Now, when you look at inflation in the uh, 70s and 80s, and I remember this very vividly because I was actually involved in the early 70s with the Australian trade union movement. So I was aware of the level of demand that we had and, um, and the, um, uh, the, the level of un unemployment as well. When I went to university in 1971, the unemployment rate was one and a half percent. And by 73, it was 1%. So the far, far lower in unemployment we have now, very strong bargaining power for workers. So workers were demanding wage rises above the rate of inflation and they were getting them. But then the inflation took off. So when you look at that, you, you have those three factors, the markup, what workers demand as wages and how productive in terms of the output to labor ratio workers are. Okay. So that was a time when if you crush the working class, you would then their bargaining power and reduce the rate of inflation. And that's what actually happened. Now, when you look at where we are now, you have uh, workers are weak as hell. They've had 40 years of destroying the trade union movement. So there's virtually no trade union movement defending workers. In some ways, we're seeing a, an attempt to revive the working class trade union movement right now. But they're as weak as there's ever been. So workers aren't out there bargaining. Wage rises are well below the rate of inflation. So it's not a wage, not wages pushing prices up. It's price inflation being well above wages and workers trying to catch up, but still losing to the order of 
you know, three or four percent loss in real purchasing power per year, which is huge. Um, so what you have is uh, you do have a, de a decrease in what you might call labor productivity uh, because that's we're looking at workers here. So it's the ratio, the productivity ratio is, you know, how many units of output per worker. That's dropped for COVID reasons fundamentally. COVID supply chain breakdown, et cetera, et cetera. The manufacturing is taking longer. There are less workers available to do things. You've got workers who don't have the skill set necessary. Like, you know, when I, when I go through uh, international airports these days, half the security systems are out because too many of the workers have COVID and they therefore can't staff them. So it takes longer to get through the to the airport than it took before COVID. That's a simple, you know, consumer experience of reduced productivity. Now, nothing, interest rates will do nothing about that. In fact, it'll increase the cost because you have a longer time period from inputs to outputs now. So if you have a higher interest rate charge uh, on on the, 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 the cost that firms have in terms of debt costs and demarrage costs and, and so on, those are going to go up. So in front, putting interest rates well up will increase the effect of uh, rising costs on, on the inflation. But the other factor that's vacant is the markup that capitalists put on their inputs. And there is a good argument that that has gone through the roof under COVID because the huge increase in money supply from the government spending, which was necessary to avoid a financial crisis, that has meant that firms have got the, they're all wash with demand. So they can increase their markups. And when you look at it, I haven't done the statistical work myself now. I've seen reports on it. But in terms of the, 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 the stuff that I've seen, roughly speaking, 70% of the change in price that people are finding is due to increase markups by firms. 20% is due to increase uh, to production. And of the order of 10% is coming out of wages. Now, if you put interest rates up and, and you also have fiscal restraint being imposed, that can reduce the excess demand that firms are experiencing and cause them to reduce markups. And that could bring the rate of inflation down. Very good, as opposed to what we're doing now. And um, I know Ty's mm -hmm. talked about the inflation quite a bit and got into a few Twitter battles, but um, maybe he can bring that up in next episode. Um, <clears throat> well, we have, uh, I, I think, time for a few questions. Um, Ty, uh, do you want to bring those up? So, yeah, how do you react when people call overpopulation arguments as anti-human or Malthusian? Well, let's gloss over Malthusian just for a minute because we've already said Steve's a Frank. adamant <laughs> Malthusian, but... Um, or worse, right? Um, how do you advocate for overpopulation solutions without uh, a humanitarian backlash? I point out that we're not the only preachers on the planet. And if you look at the actual number of life forms on the planet, rather than the number of humans, we've got a co population collapse going on right now. The huge plunge in the number of life forms on this planet. Uh, and the reason is there's too many of a particular life form called humans. And, and there are some of those humans consuming far too much. So we have to reduce our load on the planet. And in that sense, yes, I'm happy to be called Malthusian because what Malthus was not, he didn't put it across all that well. He got some parts of it wrong. But the basic idea was he said, you can't have exponential growth on a finite planet. And that's entirely correct. We've tried to grow at an at a, at a inf infinite long-term rate, forever growing every year. The only way that can continue happening is we take up more and more of the space that's available for life on this planet. Now, that'd be okay if we didn't depend upon life on this planet to be alive ourselves. Unfortunately, we do. So we have to say we've, 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 far, we've far exceeded how many humans there should be. We've far exceeded how much can humans consume. We have to cut back on both. And that's uh, I'm quite happy to say that and be quite aggressive about it because uh, you know it, it's reality. We, we simply... We simply have to accept that we cannot uh, take all the resources of the planet for ourselves. And yet, when you look at the amount we're actually consuming, and even living out carb global global warming from the picture, using a human ecological footprint, we're already consuming 1.6 times what the planet can reproduce when you take into account carbon six and sinks, and 80% of what it could consume when you don't even bother looking at carbon. And that's leaving 20% for the remaining life forms on the planet. Well, that's not enough. So we have to cut back our consumption. All right. So we have to cut back our consumption. But um, is it is it an answer you're comfortable giving to say how we deal with population? And 
I mean, it, do you have an answer for that, or you no, just created the problem, right? No. It, it, well, the thing, the thing is, the only way we can do it, all, you know, we we know that if uh, like if we look at reproduction rates of humans, it, they've risen so much because our birth rates have fallen a bit, and our death rates have fallen dramatically because of fundamentally sanitation, okay? bringing in large scale sanitation, clean water, uh, uh, which is absolutely vital. Uh, you know, Marx and Jenny, uh, Carl and Jenny Marx left Chelsea in the 1800s because of a cholera outbreak in London. Okay? So we don't have cholera breaks in London anymore. And the reason is because of sanitation. So that's, uh, and then, then we have the food consumption. We've been consuming far more food than is actually reproducible on the planet on a sustainable basis because of superphosphate. So that's the, um, the, the, when you take those two into account, we're far exceeding what we should be. We have to get back to what we could do without having to have brown food, it's superphosphate coming from fossil fuel. And that means of the order of one or two billion humans. Now, to get there from eight billion, there are two ways you can do it. You can do it by planning or you can do it by climate catastrophe. Um, by planning means you've got to restrict people's productivity, fecundity. You know, only such a percentage of the population could have kids. Uh, you know, the one child policy that China's tried and so on. Uh, and that's totally goes against our human attitude that we should have as many kids as we like. Now, in the past, um, society, the, the nature took care of that because we would you know, die of diseases and die of starvation. Um, we're likely to face the same thing, frankly, in the next 80 years. So the safe way to do it is say we simply have to control and reduce the load. And that's just, you know, I know, I know it goes totally against the whole libertarian basis of modern society. And I think, well, libertarianism got us into this problem in the first place. Hmm. I've heard that uh, in, in, the, um, in the, prosperous, the prosperous economic countries um, in the West, I guess, we could just to simplify that, that the... Uh, the birth rate is is approximately two uh, two children per. So it's kind of stabilizing, but it's countries like um, Africa, for example, the the birth rate is dramatically increasing to seven, eight, nine, ten child, uh, kids per uh, per per couple, and um, and I think it's for reasons that you talk about: better conditions, better um, uh, situations, better sanitation. And that's very difficult to try and, uh, I guess, police or uh, implement a policy around for the reasons that you've explained, um, and probably one that you haven't explained, and that would be the religious, um, the Christian ideology yeah. that is uh, go forth and multiply and and uh, anything anything to the um, opposite of that is or anything that that is um that opposes that is um a fundamental uh, is antagonistic to the to, to the religious freedoms and would, would that be safe to say i know i think it's uh, very safe to say and look if you look at some look look at you know, sort of dystopia visions of the future like even 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 a utopia vision like star trek part of that utopia was we went through such a calamitous period that we completely changed the nature of our social philosophy and without that we wouldn't survive well i think that's quite realistic we're we're on the we're we're, we're on the pre-star trek days we won't actually reach star trek of course that's physically impossible but uh, part of what gave us that whole you know peace love and friendship and uh, uh attitude uh was that we went through a existential crisis and i think that's what we face right okay so we got one question here i think it's the last question nod if it is uh ty um, do you agree with the uh, raising of interest rates to control inflation or it will lead to stagflation? I, inflation, what, what interest rates are first going to do is cause asset markets to crash, housing markets. Now, private uh, central banks inflated asset markets through first low interest rates in QE to begin with. So I'm not too worried about that happening, but that'll mean a credit crisis and a... Uh, a recession caused by government policy. So that in its own way 
isn't exactly the way we want to proceed. And of course, with, if you have the fiscal tightening at the same time, that'll reduce the headroom firms for the, the markups they put on their input costs. So that will cause inflation to come down, but it will also cause a recession. So, um, you know, in some ways you can't avoid, if you had a boom like this beforehand caused by inflated asset prices, too low interest rates, uh, the wrong sort of meddling by central banks and insufficient government deficits, um, then which is you know, got huge levels of private debt and not, and not enough public, public money, um, then you've got a messy way through it. I would rather see the government effectively go, go in the direction almost of a universal basic income. So when, you get un, when you're unemployed, you're not unable to spend and you're not able to consume. Uh, and, and, and then, uh, but, but also, you, you, you know, the interest rates causing a, a crash in asset markets, you're going to have to do a lot to counteract that. So the governments won't be able to get away with the fiscal tightening. So in some ways, putting up interest rate now is, is, is the wrong thing to do because it gives banks two problems. It gives governments two problems to cope with rather than one. I would rather than have the, the uh, have the, the problem of the inflation without also, without also having a crash in asset market, the possibility for a deflationary experience, uh, and that's quite feasible if we had a you know if we have a dramatic crash in credit like we had in the Great Depression, and we have governments cutting back on spending, and high interest rates all at the one time, then you could have a plunge in private in in um, in markups, and this is one thing which Fisher said was the reason the Great Depression was so bad, because since firms were facing a collapse in their markups, they were trying to sell at discount prices to get as much of the demand in their doors rather than their rivals. And that meant that the overall, uh, that the price level fell as they try to pay their debts back. But as they paid the debts back, they reduced the amount of money in circulation. And therefore the sort of the, the real value of money rose in that whole process. And Fisher's little, what I call Fisher's paradox was the statement, the more debtors pay, the more they owe. And that's what I think we face. So, um, you know, we're going about it the wrong way, but in some ways avoiding avoiding pain is inevitable. It not, is not possible when you've had such an overinflated economy beforehand. Mm. Okay. Well, um, one, one, one more question. Okay. Um, mm. So does the U.S. war spending? Oh, does U.S. US... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. I, I think they're opposite, and the war spending is actually probably increasing the strength of the American American dollar. And like the usual story, whenever there's a crisis, there's a there's a, a retreat to, to safety, which means people buy American bonds rather than uh, European or or Asian bonds, and so the American dollar increases in value. So that's and that then makes the American financial sector more powerful. So I think the war spending is going to make it stronger. With the BRICS and de-dollarizing, that, that's a possibility. I mean, I, I want to see that happen. I want to see something which leads to an international currency that's not the US dollar. So the best situation would be something like the Bancor. But if we can't get that, then having two currencies rather than one is probably a better way to go about it. So I'm, I'm in favor of that, and that will reduce US hegemony. And we need it. I mean, the, the United States financial sector run the system is one reason we've caught up in a whole bunch of Ponzi schemes. Hmm. Well, good explanation. Welcome back. We got Ty in the middle there, and uh, that's at the top of the hour. Steve, it's always a pleasure to see you and um, participate in an hour with you and uh, and share this with the audience. Until next week, um, I want to thank everybody for joining us, and thanks, Steve. Thanks, Tyrone, and we yep. will see you all next week.